This is Metro Week. Our top story, Tucson's search for a new city manager. We'll get an exit interview with the city's top administrator. Then we review the week's news with our journalists roundtable. Hi, I'm Andrea Kelly. The Tucson City Council is searching for a new city manager. Here's a look at how that process is shaping up, followed by an interview with manager Richard Miranda as he nears his retirement date. Miranda started as a police officer in Tucson in 1975 and was police chief for about a decade when he retired in 2008 and became an assistant city manager. After his boss, Mike Letcher, was fired in 2011, Miranda was promoted to interim and then permanent city manager. He is the fourth person to hold the position in the past decade. The city council decided to conduct a national search with some caveats. The process will actually be a hybrid. A national search firm will forward its recommendations to a local search committee, which will select the finalists. The search is expected to cost a few hundred thousand dollars. The money must come from the city manager's office budget. In the meantime, the city council promoted former assistant city manager Martha Durkin to the interim manager position, meaning she will not be eligible to apply for the permanent position, a stipulation the council made so the search would be more competitive. Mayor Jonathan Rothschild says the search for a new, permanent city manager should not be rushed. We asked Miranda why he has chosen now to end a 39-year career with the city. Well, I think that all of us... Uh in our lives, we set goals for ourselves, and in my particular case, I had to set goals for the organization and the community. And uh, the issues that were concerning us at the time when I took over as city manager primarily dealt with trust and confidence in the management of the city. So the objectives set with that were built along a, a number of parameters that included, again, providing stability in the management of the city, making sure that the processes and controls in the management of the city were in place that there was adequate transparency within the government so the community could see what we were doing. And then you add other projects such as the streetcar project and taking care of our streets and medians uh, so that they became presentable, observable, and again, making sure that the community had trust in what we were doing was paramount to me. And as we got through with the budget process and uh, the culmination of the streetcar process coming along the line and July, we're going to start service there. I, I kind of said to myself, you know what, it, it's time. It's time. I've been here for about 40 years, and uh, I think it's time to take a look at what's out there outside the city of Tucson. So it, the timing was just right. What's your legacy at, when you leave as city manager? I don't know if you can put it in a metric. When uh, I, I drive downtown now, you see a lot of people. You see uh, vitality. You see invigoration. And I'm, love to be a part of that. I think the streetcar project uh, is going to be a game changer for this community. It is the largest construction project that we've ever had. The investment along that streetcar line has been uh, tremendous. Uh, and then, again, I think if you look at the economic vitality in terms of making the city observable with uh, the uh, 409 program where we're going out and fixing the streets and taking care of the medians, uh, I think that the mission statement that we've put together of providing quality services to our community has been grasped and become a part of life for city employees so that they understand that the mission of our community is one to make ourselves look better uh, as a city so that we amplify uh, not only to the state but the rest of the world that Tucson is a great place to live. And I think that uh, is a, a broadcast that people hear all the time now. So. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be a part of that, and I don't know if it's a legacy of me, but I think it's a legacy of this community to understand that uh, we are a great community, we are a great city, and uh, we have to go out and tell people about that. When you first retired from the police department and began collecting a pension from that job, and then you came and took the assistant city manager job, people accused you of double dipping, having sort of two taxpayer salaries um, at once. And then, um, you know, retirement is based on the top three years in a position, and you're just about to hit three years as city manager. Was this a financial decision? No, I, I think that my my uh, decision to to retire to step down was primarily based on what I've said before. I think that the the objectives I set for myself and the objectives I set for the organization have been met. Uh, the issue of my salary and uh, the pension. Uh, has been 
one that's come up over the past six, seven years. And uh, I think it's important to note that you know, the, the salary that was given to me back in 1975 when I started uh, the, uh, the police department was an entry level salary. And then from then, every job I've had, I've, I've competed for. And that uh, there's been quite observability and transparency uh, in what I've done. So uh, the criticism uh, I've heard, and I am certainly appreciative of all the opportunities that have been given to me, uh, both in terms of my professional development, my education, and financial. Uh, but again, I, I, the platform for me was that uh, I felt I needed to serve my community, uh, and I wanted to do the best job I could in any job that I was given to, and that uh, that was strictly strictly my, my goal in, in any job that I took. You've managed the city during some tough budget years where there was a deficit each year that you've been in, uh, at the end of the, looking into the next fiscal year. If you didn't have to get approval from a city council, would you have done anything differently in the budgeting decisions that have been made during your time? Well, the the foundation for our budget is primarily based on sales tax. And the restriction from my point of view on the city manager is the restrictions on revenues that we can assess uh, through the sales tax. Uh, I, I think that the budget process is one where we need to discuss how can we uh, take a look at alternative revenues to get infused into our budget process. And I think that when we start talking about changing the char charter uh, and uh, we talk about the options that are there, uh, I'm going to amplify to the council that, uh, that it, those are issues that have to be uh, put out there for discussion because the checkbook is, is shrinking. The economy uh, is coming back, but it's not coming back as uh, rapidly as we thought it would be. But there are other issues there that have to be addressed which are going to be requiring us to look at other revenues. The infrastructure of our city is old, it's tired, it's fatigued, and we have to work on that. Uh, there's economic development that needs investment. Uh, there are other issues that deal with the quality of life that are going to require us to uh, think about and put some money towards that. But again, fundamental services have to be our priority. Uh, and fundamentally, uh, the money is shrinking. So. Uh, my recommendation for the council is that when we work through the charter change process, we take a look at how we can expand our avenues of revenue. Any specific examples? Well, I, I look at the county, and not that I would go there, but the county uh, has a process to deal with, with property taxes and how they can expand in certain areas to uh, deal with that by, by issuing taxes. But, uh, our charter really restricts us in what we can do there. So the examples that need to be brought forward are really, are, again, a, a, a point of discussion with, with the community. There are some taxes that we all know that will never fly. Uh, we know that there are some issues there that are important to the community that cost us and they want them funded through the sales tax. So uh, I, I think that those, those ideas, those thoughts really need to come through the charter process. Looking back 10 years to 2004, counting your successor, the person who starts in August, there will have been five city managers in a decade. Um, Jim Keene, Mike Hine, Mike Letcher, yourself, and then the person who follows you. Right. How can the city achieve some stability in management in order to achieve some of the priorities with budgeting, with social programs, infrastructure? What needs to happen? Well, I, I really do think the city does have stability. I think when you look at my job, city manager's job, it is a 24-7 job, and it has really been um, amplified in terms of commitment through uh, text messaging, email, uh, cell phones. Uh, I am always connected to somebody in the community 24-7. So I, I think that uh, in terms of stability, uh, you've had that because you've had the commitment from my predecessors and myself uh, to fulfill that job. Uh, I think that we are in a period now, and I look at other cities within the United States where maybe the time frame is three to five years for a city manager because uh, the uh, 
commitment to your community, the commitment to your organization, uh, really bumps into your, your personal life. And uh, sometimes that fatigue sets in. Uh, but I think that if you look around uh, to good city managers, uh, they know what their goals are, they know what their objectives are, and they go out and achieve them through their people. And I think we've done that here. Uh, I think the days of the Joel Valdez where you have a city manager for 14 years are gone. They're done. It's not going to happen. Uh, because when Joel was manager, um, there weren't cell phones, there weren't emails, uh, there weren't text messages, there weren't social media. Uh, and uh, that kind of pressure wasn't there. Uh, the pressure on us as city managers, pressure on my staff uh, is really 24-7. So to get three to five years out of, of a manager, I think you, you have stability. Hi, I'm Lorraine Rivetta. Join me next for Arizona Week when we take a look at the upcoming midterm election. Here to discuss the top news of the week, Dylan Smith of TucsonSentinel.com, Dan Shearer of the Green Valley News and Sawarita Sun, and Vanessa Barchfield of Arizona Public Media. Thank you all for being here. Dylan, we just heard from the outgoing city manager, Richard Miranda. Obviously, the city's looking to, for a new permanent replacement for him, but tell us a little bit about the difference between the city manager, the city council, and the mayor in terms of who has what authority. Tucson's got an interesting system that grew out of when, when the charter was instituted in 1920, the, the good government uh, movement that was across the country, and they, it sort of divvies up the powers that uh, the council and the mayor are supposed to set policy, and then the city manager is supposed to actually carry those out and, uh, and make sure that the, the, the bureaucrats are actually doing their job that they are supposed to be doing. And so the, the mayor is, uh, you know, actually has the least amount of authority in the city. It's uh, mostly a, a bully pulpit that uh, he can vote to hire certain people but can't vote to fire them. There, you know, there's a, a lot of restrictions on the power of the mayor and a lot of that, the, the real power goes to the city manager. So that's called a weak mayor system. Some people might also call it strong manager. Yeah. Do we actually see the manager making a lot of the main decisions? Um, well, he certainly proposes a lot of the main decisions. As we just saw going through the, the city budget process, that uh, a, a lot of the city manager's uh, proposals got completely knocked down by the council because they were politically untenable for them to support. But it, it, he's more of a he or she, depending on who we get, is uh, the person who's supposed to take those policies and put them into action and work out how they actually get you know, put into place in the most effective way. So do you think that most Tucsonans will notice a difference when there is a change? That, that's probably something that would take a couple of years, you know, as you move through and the city manager is proposing things and if they're going to stick around for a while, the council is probably going to be supportive of what they're after. You know, as we've seen, you know, we've gone through a number of city managers over the past decade when they got to a point where the council was just not going to support the things that they were kept proposing. Of course, all of this ties into a regional governance discussion. Dan, your papers are Green Valley and Sawarita. How important is a new manager in the city of Tucson to those outlying areas when we talk about that regional participation, regional cooperation on major issues? You know, I guess the, the question here is who's the big dog in southern Arizona? And I hope that the new city manager realizes that cooperation is, is the key here, cooperation with everybody in the region because we all have to get together to draw on the opportunities that come with living so close to the border and the opportunities that come with living in a community that's not yet over run with people and with concrete. However, if Tucson decides to stay put and not really take action, we've already seen an awful lot of leadership in this region out of uh, Marana, Oro Valley, Green Valley, Sawarita, Vale. They're doing some great things. So uh, it's better if we're all together, but I don't think that the rest of, uh, the, rest of the region is going to wait uh, for Tucson to get its act together. Is that something that you're hearing, that Tucson doesn't have his act together from the viewpoints of these outer areas? Well, I think Dylan just brought it up. What is this? Uh, this is going to be the fifth uh, city manager in a decade. So there's a little bit of instability there. It was addressed in the interview. So uh, I'm not going to go so far as to say they don't have their act together, but between them and the city council and what we see with TUSD over the years, uh, it's, it's a little wobbly. Now, Dylan, that's something, as we did just hear in the interview, uh, the city manager said having a changeover every two or three years is becoming the norm for city management, although I will say we don't see that as often in those smaller jurisdictions. Um, what does that mean for long-term or short-term stability? <laughs> Well, you don't want to have somebody do every year, especially if you're hiring somebody who is from outside the community who has to come in here and learn this town and how things work and uh, what the political pressures are and what people really want. 
you know, that's a, a difficult job if you're not familiar with the community. The, you know, most of our recent city managers have been local people who've moved up the ranks, so that's been a, a little bit different. And we did say in the piece that the interim city manager, Martha Durkin, right now will not be eligible to apply for that permanent job. So there's a little bit of a difference there yeah. in that. We should also point out that we haven't really seen too much of the, the process setting for how they're going to, what they're looking for when they hire the new manager, because they're still figuring out which national firm to work with to help them through that process. The city council is. So still more to come on this. I'm sure it's not the last time we'll talk about it. Vanessa, another big news story of this week is the U of A announcing that it's going to ban tobacco products on the campus starting in about a month. Mm -hmm. How did this decision come about? Um, it's actually something that, that's been discussed for several years. Um, I spoke with uh, a few administrators um, around campus and and they all say that this particular, that the ban now was really a student-led movement. Um, uh, over the, the spring semester of this year, the student um, health organization essentially, essentially got backing from the faculty senate, um, the student governing board for this policy change. Um, and they announced it a few months ago, they've been accepting um, public comment for, on the policy, and actually the, the public has until July 27th to, to, to submit their input. Uh, Let me follow up on that, though. Yeah. The, in your reporting, it sounds like this is a done deal, and so why seek public comment on something that's happening either way? It's kind of a formality, actually. Um, the university is required to, to seek public input when, uh, when they introduce a policy change or a new policy that affects the community as a whole. Um, but is there any kind of input that would make it not happen? I, I don't think so. I mean, they announced that all students and staff got an email this week actually yeah. saying that it's happening. Um, so and if you don't like it, you can comment at the very bottom. There. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a huge wave, too, because we have 1,400 colleges and universities across the country that have already done this, about half of those just in the last three years. Mm -hmm. so the, but the real sticking point is the e-cigarettes and whether they're going to ban those or not. And only about 15% uh, of those colleges have actually banned e-cigarettes. And I think it's, it's interesting because it used to be you can't smoke because you're affecting me as a non-smoker. Now it's you can't smoke because it's bad for you and I think that's probably not sitting well with some people yeah um, the ban on e-cigarettes is by far the most controversial part of this pro the, this policy change um, and it is actually what distinguishes the University of Arizona's ban um, ASU implemented a similar ban last year they still allow e-cigarettes um, and a lot of the feedback that the community that the university is receiving is you know from smokers saying uh, this is a cessation Smoking exactly. cessation um, product, uh, you know, like it, it Help this, us. the health <laughs> benefits haven't been shown yet. Yeah. Um, this the policy would go so far as to ban the possession of tobacco products on campus, right? You can't just keep them in your pocket and not smoke them. You can't bring them on campus. I'm not actually sure about that. I know that smoking isn't allowed, and you know they're not gonna. They're certainly not gonna be checking people's backpacks <laughs> or anything like that. So I guess I want to know: Are we back to smoking in the boys' room? <laughs> really? That's what we're gonna be getting back to because I think there's gonna be an awful lot of cheating going on because it's a long way off campus from certain places. Well, and enforcement is a major issue. Actually, right. the, the university is saying that they aren't gonna issue citations, so people won't be ticketed. Um, it's really going to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis, which is a, what most of the universities across the country are doing. ASU is doing the same thing. Um, um, staff members who are caught smoking may be uh, reported to their supervisors. Students will be reported to their student representatives. Um, so uh, yeah, enforcement will, will be interesting to see how they, they implement this. Mm. Well, see, you mentioned the 1,400 other colleges and universities that do this. So there are some models, but I do think there's some differences here. We'll have to see as we go along. Mm -hmm. Another big issue this week, uh, campaign finance in our southern Arizona congressional districts. Dylan, we saw the numbers, the, the campaign finance figures were due this week. And uh, Congressional District 2 had some interesting information in it. Give us a review. Well, there's a, a lot of jawing going back and forth between uh, Ron Barber and Martha McSally over their uh, comparative fundraising efforts. And they're both trying to put the best spin they possibly can. But for pretty much the past year, McSally has been outraising Barber by uh, you know, a, a pretty decent margin, but uh, Ron Barber started with a larger campaign war chest and has been spending a lot less money. So he's got a lot more money in the bank right now. Of course, he doesn't have a primary, so there may be less incentive to yeah. spend at this point. And we are seeing both parties planning to spend more later in the cycle. What about the other two Republicans running against Martha McSally? 
their fundraising efforts have been, uh, you know, in comparison, very anemic. They're not uh, pulling in the, uh, that, you know, flood of national money. Okay. And it's going to really, you know, it, voting starts very soon, and uh, they really haven't gotten the word out in a way to, to make any sort of dent. Those early ballots go out at the end of this month. Dan, what do we see as kind of the big issues boiling up in this race? Well, I think we see uh, immigration, obviously, the economy. You're going to see a lot of stuff that's that's in the news right now. It may not be the most important type of stuff, but it, they want to reg, uh, register with the voters uh, that they're in tune with what their concerns are. I think also one of the questions we're going to ask, and we have got a forum coming up on July 26, uh, 2 p.m. at Quail Creek. It's public. Anybody can come. All three GOP primary candidates for CD2 have committed to that. So we have Shelley Kice, Chuck Wooten, and Martha McSally. Uh, but what we're seeing there is, um, uh, I guess what, the, what we want to communicate to people is that this is, not, this is not a done deal. These three need to go in front of the people and need to answer the questions, and they're willing to do that. So let's get through the GOP primary before we start talking about Ron Barber versus Sal, uh, McSally. So we're, we're just not there yet. So uh, it, it's, it's still a ways to go. That is, uh, again, Saturday, July 26. Welcome, everybody, to get down there. And your newspaper is one of the sponsors, right? We're one of the sponsors, Green Valley, uh, Sawarita Republican Club, and the Quail Creek Republican Club. Okay. Other issues popping down in Green Valley. You guys were reporting on a murder-suicide that happened in the past week or so, and a little bit of the fallout of that. What's the reaction from the community on that? You know, it, it, it's interesting because uh, what we had was we had a couple who, uh, the, the man had a terminal illness, and he also had a, a broken leg, and he had, um, uh, everything was just not going right. And it just swirled and depression and everything. And he shot his wife, uh, who was not ill, by the way, and then he killed himself. The day that story was published, I had somebody come up to me in a restaurant and say, I'm glad you put that on the front page because this is the type of stuff we need to be talking about in Green Valley. And so what this person was talking about was the larger issue of suicide, which is much bigger than obviously murder suicide. And as you look at the rates, Arizona has always been in the top 10 states for suicide. But in 2000, we were the leading state uh, for suicide in people 65 and over. And so in 2004, Governor Napolitano uh, started um, a program called Aging 2020. And to this date, 10 years later, all state departments have got to weigh in on what they're doing to help address some of these concerns for, for the elderly. And, uh, and it's actually been a good program on some levels, and suicide is, is one of those. The real tragedy, though, in the Green Valley case was that there is help. There is help for people who are facing this, uh, but that you have to want the help, and then you have to reach out for the help. And so that's, that's uh, it, it's really hit the community hard. We did a series on suicide prevention um, earlier this year here at Arizona Public Media, and we split it up into age groups, essentially. And one of the reports was on elderly suicides. And we found shocking numbers of suicides in people. Elderly might not be the right word, because 50 plus mm -hmm. um, is actually the group that has the highest numbers. And, and one of the issues we really found out about is that talking about it and, and really addressing the issue just isn't happening. And then, and then it happens more because people don't feel there's another way out. So. Yeah, and I guess the real question here is, what's the cure for hopelessness? You know, and that's really it. But I will tell you this, that we have a program going on uh, in September. It's going to be addressed, and it's basically helping you identify if your neighbor or your friend or your spouse is considering uh, suicide. And so we're just, it's a very uncomfortable topic, but it has to be addressed, and we're going to be doing it. Dylan, another issue we were looking at this week is the continuing story of the unaccompanied minors crossing the border and then also uh, Department of Homeland Security sheltering them in Arizona. We saw protests of some children who were purported to have been moving to the o um, Oracle area in Southern Arizona. I'm still not quite County. sure if there was actually yeah. a bus that was scheduled to right. be there. Was there that day someone going? Was there not? We hear they, they still might be arriving. Maybe they're there. Um, why was this such a hot button issue this time when we haven't seen that boil over so far? In other uh, shelters, even you know here in Tucson, we didn't see uh, that you know that level of uh, uh, fervor about it. And it really began um, last week when uh, Pinal County Sheriff Paul Babu told one of his political supporters in a, a public meeting that they're you know they're coming to your town, and uh, you know he, th th this gentleman and uh, some of his friends got together and you know really amped up the, the rhetoric around this and called for a protest and a, a blockade of this bus that was supposed to show up. That never did, right? No, and one and of the things we saw here was that... Another bus showed up. State Representative Adam Quasman was there to protest and 
turned into this national news story that he was talking about seeing the kids when he really didn't. Why was that getting so much attention? Well, he pretty much stepped in it. Uh, uh, in the middle of the protest, a uh, school bus filled with uh, campers headed to the YMCA camp rolled through and they briefly blocked it. And uh, Quasman uh, tweeted about it saying that, you know, they, they, these kids were afraid and then uh, left and, uh, you know, when questioned a few hours later, it you know became apparent that uh, you know, to to him at that point that you know those weren't the uh, the migrant children going to the other camp. And instead, who they were, uh, Vanessa, you've been actually doing a series on summer camps. Probably the last thing you expected is that one of those that you covered <laughs> were, landed itself right in the middle of this exactly. news story. Yeah. What is the camp that those kids were going to? These campers were going to the Triangle Y camp, which is just a few miles outside of Oracle, where the protest was. Um, I visited the Triangle Y camp in the first week of my series, it was about two weeks ago. And um, the great irony, of course, is that it's a camp that really is all about inclusion and understanding people from different backgrounds, religions, cultural experiences, socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, that fifty percent of the the camp counselors there are from abroad. Um, so you know, it's very, very sort of ironic that 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 was the bus that happened to be going through this town at that time. Dan, we've heard, a lot, uh, you know, the politics of immigration is not is is everywhere in Arizona, and we've seen we've seen different political opinions about checkpoints in the Green Valley area or south of Green Valley, and uh, whether they should move north. Even, what are you hearing regarding these these shelters, these proposed temporary housing? Is there anything happening in Green Valley in terms of political response? What we've had is uh, some churches that are very politically astute, and they've been quite involved in this. They've been coming up to the Greyhound Station. There have been regular protests at the Border Patrol checkpoint on Aravaca Road, actually, uh, addressed by, um, led by a, a couple of groups down there. So it, it is always stirring down there, and it certainly is um, uh, a hot-button issue forever. The Quasman thing is really interesting to me because, again, here we are, the media focusing on a symptom rather than the real problem, and this thing has gone all over and everybody knows about it, but really, what is the problem? How are we going to solve the problem that we that we need some immigration reform? And again, nobody seems to want to talk about that, and that's disappointing to me as a journalist. What is the issue that the pro the protesters have with that Aravaca checkpoint? Well, it depends on who you ask. Uh, some would say that uh, the people in Aravaca who are running drugs would like to have one less hurdle, uh, and others would say uh, that that it, that it keeps them safe. But really, it's uh, to get in or out of Aravaca, you've got to uh, go through this. Actually, going into Aravaca, you actually don't. You just drive through it. But coming out of it, they say uh, the school is on the other side of it, and the, so the kids are feeling uh, uncomfortable, that it's just uh, it's unnecessary. But the big problem is that the Border Patrol will not tell us how effective it is. What do they actually catch there? And so that's really uh, frustrating for people. We don't even know if it's effective. And I wish the Border Patrol would release some of those numbers, because then it would address some of the issues. And this is one of those road roadway checkpoints, like we like we see on Ajo Highway, for example. Correct, uh, and and it, but it but it's permanent. Yeah, okay. and and it's about two miles down the road uh, near Sopery School. So. And is it really slowing things down, or no? It's just not that busy there, fr frankly. I think they just they just don't like it. Some people feel like it's a police state or military or whatever. Uh, I m I would suspect that they catch a lot there, but that it's also a deterrent and, and that it's effective. But there are a lot of groups who just say, well, show us the numbers. And the Border Patrol is notorious at not being able to keep very good numbers. And they're not showing them, um, uh, us the numbers. Well, on even these. if they keep them, they don't show them to yeah, yeah, anybody. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Discussed that, that at this table before. Yep. You know, also on, on the uh, immigration issue, last late last week, the Pima County Health Department director released a memo saying there have been these, these questions of whether these kids who are coming from Central America are bringing illness and potentially putting everyone who lives here at risk. He released a memo that said the, that's not the case, that there is no higher incidence of illness, the flu, chicken pox, uh, tuberculosis in these children than any other m big population um, of kids. That's something that, we, that was a national conversation. Did any of you hear that locally in your reporting? You cover health. You guys cover different communities. A, a little bit, you know. Uh, the, the people who were uh, protesting up in Oracle, you know, that was certainly one of the things that got them amped up. And you know, on a national level, we've heard heard some, you know, some pretty uh, heated rhetoric with people raising the uh, possibility that these kids would bring oh, Ebola here and, and things like that. That are just, you know really beyond the realm of possibility. You know, they have found a, a few kids with the flu 
uh, but uh, really not any more than you would find in any other equivalent population of, of American kids. Thank you all for coming in this week. That's our program. For more of this week's news, including stories from NPR 89.1, go to our website. Now on Arizona Week, analysis of the statewide elections, including a crowded Republican primary in the governor's race.